here, but Laura Lee has asked if we'd do that, and so has Aunt Bobby, so we'll go ahead and post these on uh, YouTube as long as we can. Maybe we'll have to get a better camera someday. Um, you know, this last few weeks that we've been in in this country, it, it seemed a lot of, we've seen a lot of turmoil. We've seen a lot of chaos, a lot of things happening, and, and it's got a lot of people stirred up, doesn't it? Uh, you know, there's a lot of things that uh, if we get our eyes off of Christ that could be very well become something that we could worry about or be disheartened about. And last week we looked at a passage and, and we're going to continue to look at uh, what it tells us here. And it's, it's found in Hebrews chapter 12. And it's the first three verses of Hebrews chapter 12. And it says, again, this is uh, coming off of chapter 11, which chapter 11 is considered the halls of faith. In chapter 11, we find lots of examples from the Old Testament of, of people, and they were commended for their faith and, and, their, and their walk with God. But not all of the great men and women of the, of the Old Testament are listed here. There's others, and we're going to look at one of those today. But it starts out, you know, after talking about all these people and commending them for the face, it says, therefore, in verse 1, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Now, in verse 1 there, do you, you hear the author speaking to us? He's saying, let us do these things. You know, the, this re letter was written uh, to some specific people, but it was also written to us too. And we should learn from this. And he says, let us do these things. And it continues on in verse two. It says, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame and set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful man so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. You know, uh, the, this, this last verse here, you know, to grow weary. I think right now we're seeing uh, a lot of people growing weary. And not only that, they're losing heart. That, that word weary it's kemno in the, in the Greek, and it's weary to the point of sickness, spent, ready to collapse. Do you, do you see that around us? You know, maybe not so much where we live, but, you know, there's, there's areas where I, I would say that the, uh, the, the opposition to, to Christ and to the word and to the church is at an extreme compared to what we go through. And yet, even where we are, do you, do you feel yourself growing weary? You know, I, I see people, you go into to stores or you, you see them walking around and they're like, I'm not wearing a mask anymore. They've grown tired of that, haven't they? They're, they're tired of these things. They've grown weary of these things. And, 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 and notice in, in God's word, it's, you know, weary to the point of sickness. You know, it, it's interesting how the enemy comes at us. You know, he wants us to grow weary. You know, if he can do that, then he, he, he you know, once you become sick, once you become, and, and, and it's talking, you know, here is spiritual sickness. You know, you, you get that inside of you, you're, you're more willing to, to walk away, to, to depart from God's ways. You know, but ready to collapse. You know, have you ever heard the term, what's the use? You know, there, there's a lot of people saying, what's the use anymore? You know, uh, wicked will, you know, wickedness will be wickedness. Evil will be evil. Why, you know, why fight it? But then it, it goes on to say there also grow weary and lose heart. You know, uh, the idea here is to, to let out completely as to entirely succumb. They're, they're not only people that are growing weary, but they're succumbing to the, the darkness that's around us. 
You know, God has given us a warning in his word that in the end times there was going to be a great apostasy. You know, maybe we haven't hit the great apostasy, but are we starting to see precursors to it? People basically succumbing to the darkness. You know, I think about these things. You know, in what ways can, can this happen to people? What way can this happen to the church? Last week we looked at it, and, and when, we, when we stop walking with God, and, and the enemy can get us isolated. You know, we looked at that when, when God was talking to Isaac there, you know, and, and he had found nothing but turmoil, and, and in, I think it was Genesis chapter 26, you know, but then he finally found that place of rest. And, and God says, I am with you. Don't be afraid. Well, that's one way the enemy, if, if we don't realize that we're walking with God or if we're not walking with God, then, then, you know, God, you know, he's trying to tell us, walk with me. You know, I, 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 I'm, you, you shouldn't, you don't have to be afraid. I, I'm your God and I'll be with you. But what other ways can the enemy attack us? What other ways can he get us weary? You know, I think about what uh, people are going through right now in their careers or in their jobs. You know, a lot of people, their, their jobs are disappearing. <laughs> You know, certain industries out there right now are finding themselves without customers, without ways of making ends meet. You know, a lot of little stores are, are closing shop. You know, that's one way that they can grow weary because if you, don't, if, you, if you don't have food on the table, you know, you can grow weary real quick, can't you? But there's other ways too. You know, I, I, I think about what's going on right now and it seems like there's a powerful enemy out there, and he is powerful. He, you know, it, it depends on how much power we give him. But the enemy is attacking right now, attacking the church, attacking God's people. You know, and, and after a while, you know, have you ever heard of battle fatigue? You know, you fight and you fight and fight, and then after a while, it's just you can't fight anymore. That's something that, you know, maybe we're seeing a little bit of, you know, we, you know, and again, especially if you think you're all alone. Remember the prophet Elijah? You know, he just got done battling the, you know, there on Mount Carmel and, you know, the 400 prophets of Baal and, and called down fire. Then, you know, basically Jezebel says, I'm coming to get you. And he ran. He, he kind of had that battle fatigue. He, you know, he came to that point where he says, I'm the only one left, which wasn't true. We, we won't get into that today, but basically God says, no, no, I've got lots of people left. I, you know, and, and he reminded Elijah that day, I'm God. You know, none of this caught God by surprise. Do you think any of this of what we're going through right now has caught God by surprise? No. No. Do you, th do, you th do you start to feel like maybe the enemy is surrounding us and, and that there's no hope? Well, God gives us an example in his word because time and time again, as you start to look through the Bible, you know, like, like I said last week, I thought I was going to do a sermon on don't be afraid and it'd be just, you know, a few points and we'd be done with it. But you start reading in God's word, there are point after point, if, you know, God brings out of don't be afraid. Why does he tell us that? He doesn't want us to be afraid. He knows that we're going to go through things. He knows that there's going to be attacks by the enemy. There's going to be famines. There's, there's going to be times when we think we're all alone. But yet in each one of these times, God says, don't be afraid. See, the, 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 the natural reactions when you're afraid is what do you do? You retreat, right? You know, when you see somebody in battle, when they become afraid or when they become fatigued, they might turn and run away. You know, it was interesting. Last night, somebody said something about, you know, basically the enemy, there's a target on your back. You know, well, the reminder is in God's armor, there's nothing for the back. It's all for the front. The breastplate, you know, the, the shield, everything that's for facing the enemy. He says, don't be afraid of that guy. Here, use my armor. The, the same armor I used to defeat him, I'm giving you. So I want to look at another, uh, another time God is telling us not to be afraid. If you would, turn with me to the book of 2 Kings. We're going to be in chapter 6 of 2 Kings.
Now, as long as we live here on earth, there's always going to be the enemy. And there's always going to be the enemy of God's people. In the book of 2 Kings in chapter 6, you know, it says here in, in, in verse 8, Now the king of Aram was at war with Israel. You know, let me ask you, has, has times changed at all? You know, Israel was God's chosen people. Aram was, uh, was basically the, the land, you know, the, 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 the land that the Baals were, were present in, that the asterisk was uh, present in. All the pagan gods, all those idols. And, and they were at war with God's people. The, the battle continues today. So when we read this, you know, think about the battles that we're in and how they apply to us. And it says, after conferring with his officers, he said, I will set up my camp in such and such a place. The man of God sent word to the king of Israel, beware of passing that place because the Armenians are going down there. So the king of Israel checked on that place indicated by the man of God. Time and time again, or time and again, Elisha warned the king so that he was on his guard in such places. You know, notice here that, that, that you know, the man of God is speaking, warning the king. You know, we have a king too. And he warns us about going to certain places, doesn't he? That same battle that rages on, the enemy is lying in wait for us in places. There are certain places that we know we shouldn't be certain things that we know we shouldn't do, and he's already warned us the enemy is there. Don't go there. You know, here now, now it says that the, the king went out and checked up on the man of God. You know, is, is what he's telling me, is it the truth? You know, and that's where maybe some of our battle lies. Is, is God's word the truth? Do we believe what God says? Yeah. You know, so it's, it continues on. He says in verse 11, this enraged the king of Aram. He summoned his officers and demanded of them, Wit, uh, will you not tell me which of us is on the side of the king of Israel? None of us, my lord, the king said, or excuse me, none of us, my lord, the king said one of his officers, but Elisha, the prophet who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel, the very words you speak in your bedroom. Go find out where he is, the king ordered, so I can send men and capture him. The report came back, he is in Dothan. Then he sent horses and chariots and a strong force there. They went by night and surrounded the city. You know, I think it's interesting. The, the king just found out that the prophet is telling him exactly what's being said, but yet then he says, go find out where he's at so we can go capture him. You know, uh, the enemy is always at work trying to, to capture us, you know. Uh, and, and sometimes, you know, maybe even in the church, we feel like maybe, you know, who, who's against us, you know, uh, well, let's continue on. It says there, but notice it says, then he sent horses and chariots and a strong force there. They went by night and surrounded the city. You know, uh, that darkness, the enemy always, always seems to travel in the darkness, lays traps in the darkness for us. And it always seems like it is a strong force. And by world standards, you know, in, in this story, I'm sure it was a strong force. What kind of strong forces are we seeing now? from the enemy. You know, it's taken up a political battle maybe. It, it's taken on overtones of, uh, of war in our nation, of civil unrest. You know, it, it, it's a spiritual battle that we're seeing right now. You know, we're, we're, and, you know, and it's very interesting that, you know, uh, when, when, you know, Jesus said that, it, you know, in the end times there was going to be wars and rumors of war. How, how close do you think we are to those end times? Not only that, but in, in the book of Revelations, it says, you know, behold, I am coming quickly. The idea is, is once these things start to happen, that word quickly is the word that we get tachometer from. Once things start to ramp up, they're going to ramp up quickly. Does it seem like things are ramping up quickly? 
that the enemy maybe has sent out a strong force against us? Verse 15, it says, When the servant of the man of God got up and went out early the next morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Oh, my Lord, what shall we do? The servant asked. Have you ever asked God that? What should we do? What's going on around us? You know, we look and we, we, it's like we see the same thing that that servant's seen. The army surrounding God's people. Lord, what should we do? You think that servant was a little concerned? <clears throat> Thought maybe this is it. You know, uh, you know uh, the, the enemy is outside our front door, basically. He's there. He's poised to, to capture us. He's, he's going to take us away. You feel like that right now in the world? You know, it's interesting. Uh, you know, you see you the commentaries that are even coming out of some of the pulpits right now. You know, uh, you know, talking about maybe even being up here with a with a rifle and everything. It's like, wait a minute. You know, is that of God? I mean, even you know, back when they were coming to take Jesus away, you know, and, and they they pulled out their swords and remember one of them lopped off one of the servant's ears. And, and what did Christ say? He says, enough of this. Put your sword away. You know, we see things going on around us. What do you think God would say to us? Well, let's see what he says to, to his servant here. He says, do not be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed, O oh Lord, open his eyes so he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. That day, the servant's eyes were open. Now, it wasn't like he was walking around with his eyes shut in a physical sense. You know, we know what the Lord was saying here. He was saying that his eyes were, you know, his spiritual eyes were closed. How many people are walking around blind right now? Well, as we find out in 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, he says the, the God of this age has blinded the people. And he's, again, he's not talking physically, he's talking to spiritual things. I don't know about you, but I can sense and I can see a spiritual battle that's going on right now around us. Hopefully it doesn't break out into a physical battle, but it's, right now it's focused in the spiritual realm. The, you know, there's powers and principalities that have risen up against God's people. And here, Elisha has asked God, open his eyes. What did the man of, do God, or the, the man of God, or God do? He prayed. He says, you know what? Open his eyes so he'll see that the, the, the hosts of heaven, or the, the heavenly armies are out there surrounding him. I would pray that for God's people too. Because again, it's a spiritual battle that's raging right now. Verse 18 says, as the enemy came down towards him, Elisha prayed to the Lord, strike these people with blindness. So he struck them with blindness as Elisha had asked. See right now, the, 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 the people out there, the, a lot of our leaders, they're blind. They may claim to be Christian. They may, be, they may claim to be God-fearing, but their actions don't show it. They have been struck with blindness. Notice then it says there in, in verse 19, Elisha told them, talking to the enemy now, this is not the road and this is not the city. Follow me, and I will lead you to the man you are looking for. And he led them to Samaria. You know, I think that's something that, you know, maybe we should consider in these times that we're living in. What is man looking for? What is the enemy looking for? What is the world looking for? Well, it's been said that inside a man's heart, there's a void. And it's shaped just like God. 
And, and for the most part, man spends his life trying to fill that void, but nothing fits. So could we tell the world that, you know, that they're seeking for somebody that that's not the man you're looking for? His name, the one you're looking for is named Christ. He's God. And he's the only thing that fills that empty void. Notice, and he, and he leads them then. He leads them to Samaria. It says, after they'd entered the city, Elisha said, Lord, open the eyes of these men so they can see. Then the Lord opened their eyes and they looked and there they were inside Samaria. When the king of Israel saw them, he asked Elisha, shall I kill them, my father? Shall I kill them? All of a sudden, now Elisha is somebody that he, he, he's respecting. He says, you know, basically, look what you've done. You brought them. Shall I kill them? Let me ask you this. Have, is that something right now that uh, people are asking, basically? You know, uh, you think about what God says, you know, uh, what is murder in God's eyes? Hatred, isn't it? If you hate somebody, it's, it's the same as murdering. Mm -hmm. Right now, do you think there's a lot of people maybe saying this very thing, shall I kill them? You know, right now, between you and the politics, you think about the, the, the two parties. Is that being said right now in their hearts? Shall I kill them? Verse 22 says, do not kill them, he answered. Would you kill men you have captured with your own sword or bow? Set food and water before them so that they may eat and drink and then go back to their master. So he prepared a great feast for them and after they had finished eating and drinking, he sent them away, and they returned to their master. So the bands from Aram stopped raiding Israel's territory. How does God have us deal with the enemy? He, he tells us how we're to treat our own enemies, right? Basically love them, feed them, give them water. And in doing so, he says, you'll love you know, burning coals upon their heads. You know, here, you know, he could have gone out, he could have, you know, slain these, these armies, and then what would have happened to back home? They would have been seen as martyrs, and then the enemy would have rose up and sent a counter, you know, attack, and, and, and the, the battle would continue on. But yet, here he says, no, feed them. Give them a drink. You basically disarmed them now because, you know, at that point, you know, they were considered enemies, right? But yet the enemy fed us. The enemy treated us well. And not only that, they sent us back home again. Defeated the enemy's spirit, didn't you? You know, in, in, in the things that we go through right now, the enemy would have us to look and see out there that there's a superior force out there that surrounded us and is getting ready to take us out. You need to, you need to rise up and you need to, to go out and, and be ready and kill them. But yet Jesus says, enough of that. Don't be afraid. I look through God's word and he tells us this over and over and over again. But the enemy, he keeps trying. He keeps bringing up new situations. You know, the, the famine was in the land as we found out in 1 Kings. You know, and, and basically Elijah was sent to a widow. She had just a little bit of flour in a, in a jar and a little bit of oil. And, and, and God says, don't be afraid there to the widow. I'll feed you. I'll take care of you. God knows what we need. He knows our, our daily needs. In fact, in Philippians 4, 19, it says, For my God shall meet all your needs according to his riches and glories in Christ Jesus. He knows that we need food. He, knew, he knows that we need clothing. But he also knows that the enemy is out there. He, he, he's, you know, basically Jesus, he, he, he faced opposition. He faced the enemies. He, they, they, 
they sought constantly to destroy him and to kill him, yet the, the, the word continued on. And that message continues on with us to share the good news, even with our enemies. Just like in this story of, of Elisha, that day the enemy was basically defeated by love. There's another passage, if you would turn with me to Isaiah chapter 41. Isaiah chapter 41, let's start out at verse 8. And it says, But you, O Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, you descendants of Abraham, my friend. Now, now here the prophet Isaiah is, is speaking, and, and it's the words of the Lord. And, and let me ask you, does this apply to us right now? We looked at that last week in, in Galatians. We found out that by through faith, we've become the descendants of Abraham. We're, we're, we're the children of, of promise. So yes, I mean, it says here, you descendants of Abraham. Notice he says, my friend. You ever heard that? You know, we are a friend of God. That's what God calls us, my friend. I took you from the ends of the earth from its farthest corners, I called you. I said, you are my servant. I have chosen you and have not rejected you. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right Again, here God is saying, don't be afraid. You know, I, I, I think about throughout God's word. Remember uh, when Hezekiah got word that the enemy was coming? The, the letter had arrived and it's saying, basically, we're coming to destroy you. What did Hezekiah do? He took it in and laid it on the altar of the Lord and said, Lord, you got mail. And, and the Lord went out and that night destroyed I think it was 185,000 of the Assyrian army with one angel. God took care of it. I, I, I think about when, when God sent Gideon out against the armies, against the enemy, and, and what weapons did they go out with? Jars with torches and trumpets. And God that night got the victory. So the idea here is do we trust God? Do we believe what he says? When he tells us, do not fear. Don't be afraid. You know, in, in the days that we live in, if indeed we're at the very end of, uh, uh, you know, with the Lord coming back soon, then all these things are fulfillment of prophecy. They're the beginnings of childbirth, you know, the, those chi uh, the pains of childbirth that he talked about throughout his word. So it's not like God's word has failed. No. It's God warning his people that there's times coming when evil will abound. When people will call right wrong and wrong right. Boy, I don't know about you, but I see that more and more all the time. So I'm excited. Because each and every day, what we see coming out of the world just proves God's word is true. That he knew if, uh, beforehand that these things are going to happen, and yet he continues to tell us, don't be afraid. Why? He never leaves us, and he never forsakes us. So just like Elisha, do we see what God has done for us? The, 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 the protection that we have in the spiritual battle that's raging. Lord, open our eyes to see. You know, and, and that's something that we should pray for ourselves too. Lord, open my eyes 
because I don't want to be deceived. There's a lot of deceivers out there right now, a lot of false teachers, a lot of people that are claiming to be the, you know, speaking for God, but they're not. Are we asking for discernment? For clarity? Lord, not only open my eyes, but let me also have my ears open so I can hear you clearly what you're telling us and telling the church. Right now he's telling us, don't be afraid. I know what you need. You, you think that the enemy's there, that you're going to be defeated, but you're not. You know, I, I've heard time and time again stories that came out from missionaries. There, were, there was one story, and I, I'll get the details wrong, so I won't even try. But there was a missionary out in, a, in an area where there were still cannibals. And there was a very real and present danger of them getting eaten. Well, one night they, were, they had uh, retreated into a hut. And, and the missionary recounted that they, they knew that the enemy was out there, that they were being surrounded. And, and they were praying because they thought their lives were done. They thought they were going to be a part of a you know, pot of stew that day. But yet the enemy disappeared. Well, later on, you know, the, the leader of, the, of that tribe of cannibals became a Christian. And, and this missionary got to talk with him. And he says, you know, you, that one night when you, you were mad at us and you were coming after us and you were going to destroy us, why didn't you? And he said, because of all the big men surrounding you. He says, there was big giant men surrounding you with flaming swords and, and we were scared. And we fled. Kind of goes back to this story here. And this was a true story. I, I, it's been recounted time and time again. But, you know, God's protection was there with them that night. They were inside praying, Lord, protect us. Well, we can pray that too. Lord, protect us. Lord, open our eyes to see the truth. There's going to be battles. As soon as this one goes away, there'll be another one that rises up. There has been for 2,000 years. And there will be until the Lord comes back. And all the while, the Lord is saying, don't be afraid. I'm with you. But let, let us not grow weary. Let us not lose heart. It'd be real easy to do right now. You know, we always seem to go by scoreboards and it seems like God's team is losing, the enemy is winning. No, God's team has already won. They just haven't quit playing. They don't realize the, the, that the war has been already won by the Lord. So don't grow weary ready to collapse, you know. The idea is our strength should come from the Lord. Let's not lose heart, not, you know, to succumb to the enemy, to the, to the, the trials that are around us, to, to the, 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 the task that's laid out before us. Don't, don't lose heart, but trust him. Because his promises still stand to us. Because again, we are part of that promise God gave Abraham. And we're the descendants of Abraham because of our faith. So when we read the Old Testament, a lot of these things that we read, God's speaking to us too. Again, let me reread that one part from Isaiah chapter 41. So do not fear for I am with you. Do not be dismayed for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right that's God's promise to us. Let's not forget that. And let's keep on keeping on until we're called to, to be with him where he comes and gets us. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you for, for what you've told us and the promises you have given us. Lord, let us Keep our eyes affixed on you. 
for you are the author and the perfecter of our faith, Lord. And through all these times, Lord, just like Elisha's servant there, Lord, we know that when his eyes were open, Lord, we're not told much about him, but I'm sure his faith grew. Lord, help our faith to grow and be perfected so we can stand on your promises that we don't have to be afraid. Lord, we love you, and we're asking for your blessings and your guidance in all that we do. Draw us by your spirit, but Lord, once again, pour out your spirit upon us, we pray. In your son's precious name, in Jesus' name, amen.